And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. I'm one of your benevolent hosts, Carlos Zimmerman. On the other side of the table to me, as always, is my main man, Jordan Smith. We are going to be talking quite a lot about the sport of baseball mm-hmm. today. There is quite a lot to discuss. MLB Draft just wrapped up the All-Star Game, Home Run Derby. Second half is on its way starting on Friday, so there's a lot to talk about on the diamond, Jordan. First, let's take a look back at the draft. Quite an interesting draft, to say the least. No surprises at the top of it, of course. The two LSU kids, and Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz, they go first off the board to Pittsburgh and Washington, respectively. And then it was kind of just an amalgamation from there. That's your word of the day right there, amalgamation. (laughs) Go look it up. I'm not going to define it for you all right now. Is that the Stephen A. Smith thesaurus? Sure, (laughs) if you want to put it there. Your word of the day? Yeah, it is Wednesday. It is the Wednesday word of the day. There you go. So, yeah, lots on the show today, but looking at that MLB draft, obviously, no surprise. Paul Skeens going first out of LSU to Pittsburgh, and then his teammate Dylan right after him. Jordan, your thoughts on just how that all played out? Because, remember, start of the baseball season at least the collegiate level, Dylan Cruz was the presumptive number one pick. He would go to Pittsburgh. Right. But then Paul Skeens has an incredible season especially during the College World Series, and was able to jump him for the number one spot, which I think that's going to work out in the long run for Pits- for Pittsburgh. Oh, it will. It'll work out a lot better because, you know, there are, and again, we've talked about this multiple times. You know, we've talked to our friends about it. They all say the same thing, that it's very hard to, gum- to come by pitchers in the draft like Paul Skeens. That's not an everyday occurrence. Generational you know? talent. You can get players... I say you can get players like Dylan Cruz. He's a one of a kind in college baseball. Uh, but players like him, you can find really talented outfielders that are going to produce at a high level. It's not always a guarantee that you find a top rated pitcher that produces at the level that Paul Skeens did, especially after transferring uh, from the Air Force and doing what he did at LSU. But uh, yeah, I mean, I wasn't surprised by it. You know, we had talked about it um, last week about it and kind of seeing where everything was going to fall. One really two surprises. It's exactly what we were expecting. Um, I think what was kind of a little, not as much surprising, but somewhat was what happened after that, the three, four, five. Now this, now that the way it worked out was kind of about where I had put it. I think you had mentioned maybe a catcher with the Rangers potentially, or a pitcher kind of somewhere with the twins maybe and that five spot. But all of them electing for Clark, Langford, Jenkins, the three eight outfielders right after Skeens and Cruz. So I wasn't as surprised about that. Um, obviously, two highly touted high school prospects and Max Clark from Franklin Community High School out in Indiana. And then Walker Jenkins from South Brunswick in North Carolina. So, you know, it was kind of a, you know. Half and half, kind of, do you take the 18-year-old and take the risk, or do you take somebody else who maybe went through college a little older? But, again, that's just kind of, you know, if the talent's there, the talent's there, no matter where they are. Yeah, no, I mean, and it, it went not quite as high as I was expecting, mm-hmm. those three for through five, but I think they're solid picks. I mean, the ebb and flow of this entire first round was rather intriguing because normally you'll see, like, you know, teams just bounce around a bit. Right. No, after schemes? Four straight outfielders yeah. drafted. And then you bounced around a bit. You go to the shortstop out of Grand Canyon, I believe. And, you know, the folks in the WAC can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I believe the highest drafted player out of Grand Canyon I would in think their so. history in Jacob Wilson. And, I mean, like I said on the last episode, I got to see him mm-hmm. in person at the WAC tournament. And, man, this kid can play yeah. on, on all, all fronts, yeah. batting and defensively. He had a bad game against Sam Houston, but still throughout that inter- entire tournament watching him, and especially during the series that Sam Houston had with him, mm-hmm. you knew he was going to be a highly touted prospect going 6 to <laughs> Oakland, um, <laughs> but which, you know. It'll be Las Vegas. Soon. It, it will be Las Vegas, but, you know, it's a professional baseball club. Right. As much as we joke about it. Still an awesome thing for that kid over there right. from Grand Canyon. Um, I think, you know, it's and then you go 7 through 10, uh, three pitchers. And the first catcher off the board is not the one I was expecting right. to go first off the board. I was expecting Kyle Teal to be the first one off, the catcher from Virginia. But no, they get the Texas high school product, Yay. Blake Mitchell <laughs> from Sinton, the Sinton Pirates. He goes to Kansas City. 
And so that brings an interesting dynamic for for Kansas City. Because Salvi. Because you think about it. Salvi, he's in the twilight of his career. Mm-hmm. His his prime, let's be honest, it's it's beyond him at this point, oh, yeah. in my opinion. And I'm sure you, you agree with me there. But this, He's basically a Maldi kind of player. He's there because his defense is still really good. His offense is not what it used to be. Granted, I'm pretty sure he was in the All-Star game last year. I believe so, but he but, still he, he, he doesn't produce as much as he used right, to. But he's still a highly touted player. And then, like you said, this is probably one of those picks that is a – you're probably going to be the next guy to take over. Well, you know, as long as you produce, you'll get up there. You'll probably play a year or so with with Salvi, and then he may retire, and then you take over the helm kind of thing. Kind of like what we're seeing with the Astros with, with Diaz and Maldi. Uh, Lee was supposed to be that guy. He hasn't quite panned out to what his expectations were, um, but Yanir Diaz has, has started to kind of live up to that height uh, behind the dish. He's got uh, a lot of pop. He does. He really does. And the limited time that he does play, he, in, in he both produces ways. a lot. Yeah. Pop behind the plate and at the plate. Exactly. So that was good to see. Uh, and then, so, like I said, um, before I didn't mention, uh, Rhett Louder going yeah. to Cincinnati, that's a great pick for them. You know, he it was is. an absolute stud at Wake Forest. Uh, nine heck of a game in that in that LSU versus Wake Forest. One Absolutely. of the best games ever. Absolutely. Uh, nine, Chase Dollander going to Colorado mm-hmm. uh, from Tennessee. That's a great pick for them. And then another high school product going at number 10 to Miami, Noble Meyer from Jesuit High School in Oregon. So a pedestrian top 10, but mm-hmm. great picks across the board. I don't think there was really any terrible picks in there. And then looking through the rest of that first round, uh, Kyle Teal fell all the way to number 14 to go to Boston. Yeah. Um, Jacob Gonzalez from Old Miss, very highly touted shortstop. There was a lot of shortstops. There was. Drafted in this first round. I'm just going to count them off real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then three right at the end of the first round. Right. So 10 of the 28 picks were shortstops. Now – Lest we forget before we just kind of breeze over it, the pick at 16, Bryce Eldridge. Two-way. Two-way. He is a pitcher who can go about mid-90s of the fastball, um, but according to what, I guess, things I've seen online, teams are kind of preferring him to be more at first base mm. because of his six foot seven frame. He kind of has that bigger target for everybody in the infield to, to get to, obviously with that height he has. Um, but it does also benefit him because he has that extra reach to the plate. Mm-hmm. So, But, yeah, it's interesting to see another, especially for this being a high school player. And this two- isn't a college player. This is a high school two-way player, which everybody in high school is a two-way player. That, oh, yeah. That's how that works. It's like half the team pitches, and then the other half are outfield specific. That's basically it. Both your catchers usually pitch as well in a in a in – a, relief situation, but yeah. I'll just use Huntsville as an example because, yeah. you know, a, lo- a lot of the guys that played in that outfield, they had pitching backgrounds, and the right. ones that are coming back have some pitching backgrounds. So right. they, it's not unheard of in high school, but what is unheard of is, you know, a highly touted high school prospect that is strictly a two-way player, doesn't right. lean one way or the other. It's it's an, another another Shohei. So mm-hmm. we'll we'll see what how he pans out. You know, out of Virginia, now going to San Francisco. Good pickup for them. Yeah. Um, looking down further in this first round, um, a guy that I was hoping would fall to the Astros at twenty eight, but he ended up going twenty four to Atlanta. That's Hurston Waldrip from mm-hmm. Florida. I was hoping you know we could use another pitching prospect to bring up into the farm system. We need pitching prospects. Yes. So I was hoping he'd fall to us, but he didn't. So congrats to you folks in Atlanta. You get a really good guy out of Florida. Played very well for the Gators, especially during the College World Series. To just boost what they already have. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. Strider. Yeah. um, uh, Returning Max Freed. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, the list is endless. Yeah. They still got Uncle Charlie there, I believe. I believe he's still there. Um ground chuck um <laughs> so that, that that pitching rotation is going to be set for quite a long time and then now the interesting pick the final pick of the first round before you got to the pr- prospect promotion incentive pick mm-hmm. um was bryce matthews getting drafted out of nebraska by the astros now i saw at least on social media and on astros twitter which can either be a really good thing or a really <laughs> cancerous thing <laughs> 
And we got a mix of both. Right. Some people thought it was a good pick. I thought it was a good pick. But a lot of people were wondering, why did we draft a shortstop when you already have one at the top level in Jeremy Pena? So that, that was that, my question. That was, the question. that was one that made me scratch my head a little bit. But yeah. I was like, I know he was good. And another reason why they probably picked him, he's an Atascacita product. So he's coming back to Houston. Yeah. I, I, my my thing would be like, because I have the same question of, yeah, you have Pena. Now, granted, you don't want to just say, oh, yeah, Pena, let's not draft a shortstop for another 15 years. That's bad managing. Yes. But I feel like for Bryce, if he, you know, at least does decently, and he makes it to the show two, three years, right, through minor leagues, gets there two, three years, a September call up, and then joins an opening day the next year, the – only place that I could see him being, if Pena and Tuve are still there, even Bregman, you go first base, but that depends on the prospects you already have that could transition to first base. So I really don't get it. If they're bringing him up to just be a utility guy, that doesn't seem really fair. I just, I don't really understand it unless they're thinking they're not going to be able to keep Pena. Here's the here's what the point I made with you yesterday. Yeah. Um. When we were talking off the air about this, um, it's kind of the same trajectory. Pena is going to be on that same trajectory that Alex Bregman's on right now. Right. We're not certain if Bregman's going to come back after next after this season. Because it would be nice. It'd be very nice. But it's just going to depend on the you dollar af- Can you afford him amongst all the other pieces that you want to keep? Yeah. Pena is going to be right on that same track because, like I said, we called Bregman up. He got a little bit of action at the end of 16. His big year, breakout year, was in 2017, a part of the World Series team. Yeah, We're at 2023. This is year number six and a half, if you will. Right. Pena, we called him up last year after we lost Correa. And so by the time Bryce Matthews, in my opinion, where he would find himself on a major league roster, to me would be opening day 2026. I would, yeah. Pena is, Pena is right around that time, either at the end of his rookie contract or in arbitration at that point. If you want to pull that up really That's, quick and yep. see where he would be at on that. So, according to Spot Rack, <laughs> my favorite website, your, your, your baby. So, technically, he is in pre arbitration right now. Okay. He is a one year, $754,000 deal. He has pre-arbitration next year, and then he's in his first year of actual arbitration in, in 2025. So, technically, he's under team control for the next, what would that be, three seasons. Or this season, then two more, and then I think there's a second year of arbitration, or is it just the one? I'm, I'm thinking it might just be the one. But either way, the point being is that for at least two and a half more seasons, Pena's still there. So, so think about this. End of 2025, is that's his first year of arbitration mm-hmm. wrapped up. He may end up somewhere else by 2026. So I can see why the Astros front office looked at Bryce Matthews as a potential shortstop for mm-hmm. the future because, like, like you said, they're not sure if you're going to be able to keep Pena because right. the talent he has. He, he, he is literally – our new Carlos Correa, and you look at Correa's trajectory. We mm-hmm. drafted him first overall in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, or was it 2011? I believe it was 12. So, y- forgive my ignorance, folks, but <laughs> it, it's also, I'm very tired. I've been doing the morning show on it's KSAM. i tired, I'm late. I've been doing the morning show on KSAM this entire week, so it's been getting up at 4.30 every day, and not going to bed until midnight the next night. So, 2012. You, you can see. So, yeah, there you go. 2012. Quick note. Looking at Alex Bregman's contract. Mm. This year, he's getting the $28.5 million. Next year, he's getting the $28.5 million. And that's the last year of his contract, correct? And that's the last year. So 2025 so. is age 31 season. He becomes an unrestricted free agent. Now, with this being the first year of the split of the 28.5, 28.5 to supplement as part of the five-year $100 million deal that he signed – uh, back in 2020 mm-hmm. uh, to get rid of the arbitration years altogether, which there was three of them, but instead he signed the deal that got rid of the arbitration and replaced it with the first three years being $11 million, right? 
So you kind of have to look at this and you have to say, okay, in 2025, realistically, what are the Astros, what's the Astros roster going to look like? You know, Jordan's going to be there because of his contract. You know, Altuve's going to be there because of the contract. Brantley, if he doesn't retire at the end of this season because of injury, he will probably be gone by then, I would say, unless he really feels like he can still do something. I... Chaz at Corbett's situation is interesting. While I do think he is the everyday starter, and I've been harping it for the last three years, I, as you know, annoyingly, you know. <laughs> um, Chaz hands. Exactly. That, that situation is kind of, you know, hit or miss sometimes with as far as is he actually going to get a contract? It's, is he going to be a trade piece later on? Is Jake Myers going to emerge or is he going to be traded? Uh, once Maldi leaves, you got Yanir, but who's going to be behind him? Which we assume is Corey Lee to be his backup, but we're not sure yet. After that, you're still looking at a first baseman. And I think that's going to be the big thing is seeing what happens this winter meetings with the Houston Astros to see what kind of a deal Alex Bregman is going to get. Because if Bregman doesn't get the right kind of deal, you know, and he goes somewhere else, that kind of opens up that spot, bringing it back to Bryce Matthews to potentially shift over to third base mm -hmm. uh, at some point in his minor league career to maybe take over that third base spot. Now, you've also got other guys coming up, you know, different positions like Drew Gilbert, for example, who could probably take over an outfield spot because I would assume the Astros, if they don't want to sign anybody for first base, they would slide Jordan over at first base and as well a DH maybe, you know, and kind of rotate that. But Now, we don't even know the situation with the outfield when it comes to Chaz and Jake Myers. We may figure it out in a couple of weeks right. at the deadline, right. which we're going to talk more about next week. Show, hey, show, hey, it's show, not going to hey. happen. <laughs> I know. We're talking about that next week. We'd I have to give up the farm and a half. We would have to give up everything but the home run pump in center field. Yeah. So – We'll talk about that more next week. Right. So, again, on the Bryce Matthews thing, I see why they're – because they're trying to amp up that infield for the future, yeah. especially the near future with just how much uncertainty is there. So I thought it was a good pick for this for what – I'm, and that's just me reading the mind mm -hmm. of the Astros' front office. So we'll see what happens there. Um, interesting touch on the competitive balance round A. There were ten picks. Mm -hmm. Nine of them were high school products. Only one college guy, and that was Ty Floyd from LSU, yeah. going to Cincinnati. One Texas high school product. Oddly enough, the alma mater of Bryce Matthews, Atascacita, Kendall George, going to Los Angeles. They've the got Dodgers, a good baseball I'll program, I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Two guys drafted in the same year at, right out of high school. That's, no, that's no, something Well, it wasn't right out of high school. Bryce Matthews was at Nebraska. Well, he played high school. Yeah, at, but at, at point being. He, I don't think he was there that long at Nebraska, right? Uh, he wasn't a four-year guy. Uh, I can pull it up right now. He's twenty-one. Oh, so he was. He was a frat. Guy. He was. A, he was. Yeah. He uh, was a guy. Uh, junior. Okay. Three-year guy. Uh, Damn. joined them in twenty twenty-one. So re a recent product of right. the Tascasita. Right. Um, George was probably a freshman when yeah. Matthews was a senior at Tascasita. Second round, you know, some good picks. Camp Alderman from for, for Miami out of Ole Miss. I thought yeah. that was a good pick. Another LSU player, Grant Taylor, one of the other pitching staff members going to the White Sox. Mm -hmm. um, Mid-major pick, Mike Bove, uh, from going to Milwaukee out of uh, Nebraska, Omaha, which I yeah. thought was interesting. And William Mary got a pick. Yeah. They got uh, Ben, ben Williamson, Williamson for to Seattle, the 52nd, 57th pick, four-year yep. senior out of college. And then the disappointment for me, once again, at the end of the round with the Astros having the last pick, when it came to pick 60, I was like, oh, my God, Jake Jal Jaloff is still on the board. Mm -hmm. And I've been high on this guy in his entire time at Virginia. He right. was one of the top players a couple of years or just a year ago, yeah. leading a lot of stats in college baseball. And I was like, he's still there. He's still there, and he's a third baseman. So you think about, you know, if Bregman were to leave, here's your third baseman of the future. Right. 
Dodgers take him at 60. Yep. I was like, <laughs> they just got their new Justin Turner. It was, it and was payback for giving out Jordan. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was the payback. <laughs> so the Astros end up with Alonzo Treadwell from UCLA, a pitcher, which, granted, we need pitching yeah. help. So that so that works fine. That works fine for me. Yeah. Uh, he had uh, he had a great career at uh, at UCLA. Nine games last year started 3.57 ERA, so not the best, but – and, and not the worst. And the thing is, too, this is a guy who was coming off of having Tommy John surgery right. his junior year in high school. Right. So, you know, obviously it took him a little bit to kind of rebuild that arm to where it needed to be. Obviously, he was never going to be 100% again from where it was before, but he got it pretty close. About a 92, 94 kind of speed on his, his top speed for fastball. Kind of sits 91, so a little bit on the lower side of the velocity, at least nowadays lower velocity. But... That means that he's got he's got good breaking stuff. He's got a good uh, curve, a change, um, you know, with the movement on it at least. It doesn't move a ton, but it moves enough to be able to at least fool the hitter and kind of create that deceitfulness with the the motion, you know, stuff. Because that's the thing: if you're a low velocity pitcher, then you got to make sure that your breaking stuff is working. Because if you're not, you're screwed. Yeah. So, or you got to make sure they chase ninety one high at the zone. Otherwise, you you better hope that your change, your curve, your splitter, your slurve, whatever you're throwing that's breaking, is is moving enough to either get ground ball contact or to get a swing and miss altogether. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a look at the first two rounds of the draft, and now for us personally here in Huntsville, there were a couple of Bearcats mm-hmm. that went off the board, or off, yeah, off the board, two teams, right. Uh, one being uh, in the fourth round, no less, Joe Redfield. Yeah. One of the, it's a, in my opinion, the newcomer of the year for the Bearcats with the way he performed coming over from Temple College, played high school ball at Waco Midway, a great high school program, and then he came here and absolutely teared it up mm-hmm. for Sam Houston. Slashed 402 on the year. Uh, I believe he had 10 home runs and 46 RBIs. Was absolute a huge boost in the Bearcats' ambitions to make it back to the uh, NCAA tournament was a big factor in that, going fourth round, 111th pick overall to the Los Angeles Angels. And his pick value set at 600,000, three, no, sorry, yeah, 600, $603,600. Yep, I found the comma. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I can never say those right. So obviously he was in the transfer portal and had committed to the Georgia Bulldogs to go along with Clayton Chadwick. We'll miss you, Chatty. Yep. But um, he obviously is probably not going to do that, and he's going to. I would, yeah, jump. I would take the money if if he's got that chance because, yeah, you're going to SEC team. Yeah, they're taking you, so you might get some playing time. But you know, it, it's unless they absolutely need you to be a starter, you you might not get enough playing time to be able to boost your draft stock. So take it while the iron's hot. And and the thing is with Georgia, and this is not to knock their program at all. Yeah. In, in terms of baseball overall, yeah. Football is where they're at yeah. as a program. Basketball, kind of middle-of-the-road. Baseball, same thing. So yeah. it's one of those middle-of-the-road SEC programs in terms of baseball. So I think Redfield will likely, more than likely, take the contract, take the signing mm-hmm. and sign with the Angels, jump into their uh, farm rookie system, go and there. go rookie ball and go from there. Yeah. So like it's, you, aw- it's awesome for Joe. Like you said, the 15 homers, the 15 of 19 stolen bases. And 61 he was games. Fast. Yeah, he's, it's very good. And, th- and this uh, is our leadoff guy. Right. We're talking about right. here. Right. And that's the thing. It's like he, like you said, the 402, 45, 683 slash, very, very good slash there. Uh, that's above uh, 1,000, probably actually uh, above 1,100 mm-hmm. OPS. So, uh, so yeah, he obviously was a very good pick for them. Um, and somebody that they hope, because you kind of start to think about it, that's going to be somebody that would. Uh, need to fill a lot of gaps in that outfield. Um, obviously, you're not going to get rid of Trout if you're the Angels, unless he says, get rid of me. Either get rid of me or retire. Exactly, because of his continued injury issues um, and the diagnosis he has with his back, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I think it, it'll be interesting to see how he does in the minor leagues, because obviously he was a good player here at Sam Houston. Uh, but it's a different ball game. When you go, we see plenty of times where really good college players don't make it in the minor league system, more or less even touch the major leagues. 
You know, there are some guys who can never even break past the double A side of things. So we'll see how he does. I think he's a player who could do well enough to get a call up. I hope he has a long career in Major League Baseball. Um, but it'll just kind of be, it's not like a Colton Kowser where you are 100%. This is a Major League Baseball player that one hands down. He, mm-hmm. He's kind of a 50 50. I think it's just going to depend on how he does early on in his minor league run, how quick he gets through rookie ball, how quick he gets through the single A's, and if he can maybe touch double A before the end of the season. And, and, and you know, there's a few there, there's a few Bearcats that are still working their way through the farm system that you and I got to see quite a lot, Jack yeah. Rogers and Kyle Backus. If I remember correctly, they weren't drafted whatsoever. And Backus has himself, I believe, at the double A level right now, and Rogers is still at high A, so they're doing it the hard way. Let me go check. Um, no, he was the Kyle Backus was not drafted. No, uh, he was signed to the deal, uh, to a deal with the Diamondbacks, right? Um, as a free agent to a minor league contract. Um, and I believe he's in the double A right now. Yeah, he is in, um, yeah, Amarillo. Yeah, he's in Amarillo. So, Sod poodles. <laughs> Such a great name. It is a very great name. <laughs> it's I, it's, such a great it, name. That's what I love about minor league baseball. <laughs> it, 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 you, you got the jumbo shrimp. Yeah. The sod poodles. My the favorite Rocket name. City trash no, pandas. My favorite name out of every single minor league baseball team that there is because it is so clever. The Macon Bacon. Ah, uh, yeah. I love it. I love it. And then. Uh, <laughs> As for Jack Rogers, he's at the high A affiliate with the Reds and yeah. not doing too shabby right now. Five home runs, 33 RBIs, and batting 243 right now. So, could you, if he boosts the average a little bit? If he boosts the average, yeah, I think he could he could get a call up. But to, yeah, to double A. And yeah. I didn't even bother to look at Backus' stats so far this year. Four and three, a 4.91 ERA, six saves so across 36 innings of work. So, a little high on the ERA, but. If he gets that down a little bit more, could be looking at a triple-A call-up at some point as right, well. So right. got, uh, some Bearcats in the past, they have been like those two. They, they have, they're doing it the hard way. So with mm-hmm. Redfield going round four, he, he, he's got, he doesn't have that same trajectory that Kowser had, but it's a little bit higher than that of those that wouldn't yeah. get drafted. And, yeah, and like I said, it's going to depend on how he does for this, this second half of the minor league season, if you will, uh, to see how much of an impact he can make. Because obviously – you're going to probably spend a week, maybe two at most, in rookie ball, and as long as you do decent, you'll get called up to the to the low A. Mm-hmm. So then it's just a matter of how he performs in the low and high A to see if he can get up to the to double A before the end of the season or if he kind of sits there in high, a for the, high and low A for the rest of the year and then gets called up maybe to a double A next year. Um, but just kind of have to wait and see how that rolls out. Yeah. And then the other pick in the – Later on in the draft, on day right. three in round 16, Justin Wyshkoski getting drafted by the San Francisco Giants. Mm-hmm. I believe that was the 480th pick overall. So we're at the point there where there's no pick value when it comes to that. Justin being a – it says he's a four-year senior here, but on Go Bearcats, he says he's a junior. So I think either way, he's got one more year it, of eligibility. It would be a four-year because of the COVID right. eligibility. Right. And he wasn't here when that happened either. That's right. the thing. So. He, so my my thing is there's a solid chance that Wish comes back for his for his last year as a Bearcat, try to boost the draft stock a bit more and maybe get higher get a higher pick in next year's draft. I mean, plus you look at it, he's got a three fifty one career average as a Bearcat. He's hovering right at about a thousand for an OPS, five nineteen slugging, four thirty five on base percentage. So he's it's over a thousand. Is it over a thousand? You said 590? 519. 519. So just under a so thousand. So he's just so under. So it's about a, around a 950-ish. So. Right, probably around a 940-something. But and either way, he's not doing too bad while he is here. Uh, I mean, you, you kind of look at it. 82 hits in 22, 80 in 20, 20, 23. Uh, both of those, his lowest average was actually this year where he played and started three more games than he did in 22. 22, he played, he played and started in 56. This year he started and played in 59. 339 this year, 369 last year. So he's doing pretty well while here at the college level. But, yeah, I mean, if I'm him, I'm trying to boost the draft. I figured he could have been someone that may have been a day two guy. 
I didn't think he would be 16 out of the 20 rounds, you know, in the draft with how well he's done at Sam Houston so far. Well, the, the, the thing is, you know, for one thing that hinders that, of course, Sam Houston doesn't get as much you know, coverage as a lot of other programs would. I mean, yeah. But at the ba- at the baseball level, I mean, a lot more people paid more attention to Sam Houston. One, because you had a highly touted prospect in the major leagues that came out of the Bearcats. Yeah. And the Bearcats were returning to the NCAA tournament for the first time in six years. Yeah. So, and, you know, Wishkoski was clutch. Yeah. I mean, lest we forget that first game of that wild conference tournament. He hits, right. a, he hits a walk-off grand slam to the literal co- left field corner, right. like a foot out to the right of the foul pole there right. at the Hocom. And that won the Bearcats that first game of the tournament. So he's a heck of a player. Not only that, he's a really good guy as well. I got to talk with him quite a bit while we were there in Arizona. So he's definitely going to find himself in a major league farm system at some point. I think – He's going to come back for one more year mm-hmm. and, like we said, boost the stock a bit more, and we'll see where he goes from there. So, real quick, as we continue to draw on this baseball <laughs> talk, second half kicks off on Friday, and we are then full steam ahead to October. Looking at the standings in the majors right now, obviously, if the playoffs were to begin today, Tampa Bay is the number one seed out of the AL. The Rangers would be the number two seed. The Guardians at 45 and 45 because the AL Central is garbage. Hey, hey. They would be the three seed. <laughs> the wild cards would be the Orioles as the first wild card. The Astros and Blue Jays are currently tied right now. They would be going, the five and six. They would be the five and six with the Yankees and the Twins and the Mariners on the outside looking in. Don't forget the Angels as well. And the Red Sox have kind of, you know, figured things out a little bit. They're above 500 now as well. So in the terms of the American League side, Jordan, this race for October, it's starting to tighten up. And this second half is going to really separate the halves from the have-nots. Oh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Watching the AL East is going to be a lot of fun. Mainly kind of see, because I'm not expecting much change out of the three through five. I think the only change you may see is the Yankees leapfrog the the Blue Jays. Other than that, I'm thinking it's a it's a two man race for that division with the Rays and the Orioles. I think that's going to be a lot of fun to watch to see how those teams kind of run down the stretch of things. I mean, you take a look at the last ten before the All Star break, the Rays went three and seven. Yeah, they dropped off a bit. Orioles six and four. They picked up a lot of ground too go just two games back, and it's kind of the similar situation. Actually, it's a carbon copy with the Astros and Rangers. Rangers go 3-7 and seven in the last 10 before the All-Star break. Astros go 6-4. and four. They're two games back. So, but granted, you kind of expect maybe you see a tiny bit of a push and a nudge from the Mariners maybe if they can figure it out, well, but otherwise they, it's it's a two-team race in the West. When they take 3-4 or four from the Astros right going into the break, I think that was right. a huge boost. Uh, for Seattle, and it couldn't have come at a better time because the Angels started to hit a skid. They only right. won one game in, in their last ten games. Right. So they, they struck when the iron was hot. Getting to host the All-Star game obviously brought a lot of pageantry to that city. So now I think the Mariners are going to have that little bit of a juice, but yeah. we'll see what the second half brings because, you know, the Astros are still trying to figure out this whole injury bug thing that they mm-hmm. continue to get hampered by and then losing games that they probably shouldn't lose. So right. as of right now, looking at this second half, the only thing I see changing is that I, I'm i going to go on on the limb here. I think the Orioles are going to win the AL East. I think the Rays will be right there with them, mm-hmm. but I think the Orioles can leapfrog them and take that division. I think it's it's going to be fun to watch, like I said. I think it's going to matter on... How much of an impact the newer guys, and you know, Jonah Westbury, Colin Kowser, how much they have an impact? Because you know the rest of the guys who have been there at least for a year, a couple of years, Gunnar Henderson, Hadley Rutschman obviously being an all-star in the home run derby, which we'll touch on here in just a second. Uh, but you know those guys, they're established. you got Felix Bautista on the bullpen. you got Cedric Mullins in the outfield. you got Austin Hayes, the, the all-star for the Orioles out in left field. You got Santander, you know, for the Orioles as well. It's a very good roster. And then you look at the Rays. You got a Rosa Reina really leading the charge out there. It's it's a lot of fun to watch these two teams play, especially with the dynamics of how these two teams are built. You look at the Rays, right? They're the prime example of 
doing it on a budget, mm-hmm. right? That That is what the Rays are. They're basically what the Athletics strive to be is the Tampa Bay Rays. And I think a lot of owners would stri- like to strive to be what the Rays are and how they build things on such a, a lower budget than the rest of baseball. The Orioles right now are just catching a time where they got a lot of young guns mixed with a couple of few veterans here and there that are really starting to make their mark. And that's why I say the Orioles, to me, are a lot like the 2017 Astros. you got a lot of young, new talent filling their gaps. you got a couple of the old veterans that are they're filling the gaps that are doing well and are teaching the young guys how to get it done with a lot of star power out of the young players, especially like Adley Rutschman. Gunnar Henderson's kind of coming into his own. you got the highly touted prospect in Colton Cowser now up with Jordan Westbury to compliment. you got all the pitching prospects. You know, you got Felix Bautista, who's an anchor in that bullpen. Having that one de- definite anchor in the bullpen really helps you when it comes late in games, especially when it comes to the postseason. Yep. So the Orioles, I think it's going to be a matter of if the Orioles get in their own way or not. Well, and the other side of that thing is the what I think is going to ultimately hurt the Rays in the long run is that their their pitching rotation is beat up mm-hmm. right now. Shane Boz, McClanahan, amongst others, they've been fighting injuries all year long, and that's what has allowed the Rays to go on this little bit of a skid that they're on right now that right. they went on in going into the break. So that's why I have the Orioles there up at the top. Central. It's up for grabs, really, from anybody from the Guardians down to the White Sox. The White Sox are 38 and 54, 16 games under 500, and they're only eight games back of the division lead. So that's up for anybody. The Tigers look interesting there, right there, smack dab in the middle at third. I'm just surprised that they're that they're 11 games under and still in a race right now. I'm not surprised that they're still in a race for the Central, but I'm more surprised that they're in a race yes. for the Central. Yes, you would think that they'd be down a little bit closer to where the Royals are right mm-hmm. now at 26 and 65, but they're – Staying moderately competitive with an old Astro in AJ Hinch at the helm. I mean, not surprising. No, and then and then there's the West. It's going to be like you said, a two horse race between the battle of I forty five between the Rangers and the Astros. Silver boot for the title. That's right. So, uh, you know, my bias is showing here, but I definitely hope that the Astros pull it off and they go back and get another AL West title. Yeah. But the Rangers, they've proven that they are a foe, a formidable foe, and you can't sleep on Seattle because if they get hot at the right time, they get hot at the right time. We saw it last year. That's right. I think the Angels taper off, and Oakland is Oakland. Yep. Briefly looking at the NL side, Braves, first team to 60 wins right going into the break. They're red hot. They're going to take the East by storm, no, no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Miami might try to give them a fight, but I it's Atlanta's division to lose. It, it is, and I think – I think it's going to be one of those things where, like you said, it's going to be Atlanta clear cut getting the getting the title, almost a district title, getting the division title, uh, and I think the Marlins are going to be that everybody's chasing them for for the wild card a wild card spot. I think is I think that's what's going to end up happening. Of course, for that scenario, you've got the Diamondbacks and the Dodgers who are technically tied at top of the West, but they're right there, right behind the Marlins for a game and two games back. Yeah of the top wild card spot as well. So it's it's a lot of madness right they're, now yeah, in the National League. It is. And then the Phillies are still trying to stay relevant at yeah. 48 and 41. I say that because they're coming off of a World Series appearance. They're kind of on that World Series hangover right now. Yeah, Not quite where they need to be. But Kyle Schwarber is still raking. So you never know what can happen. Sure, Mom. Uh, Central has been a pleasant surprise this year. I've liked it. Cincinnati, right there at the top. They're starting to see the fruits of their rebuild. They're starting to see the fruits of Ellie De La Cruz, the top yes. prospect in baseball. Absolutely. <laughs> Milwaukee is still hanging in there, right yeah. there with them. You Just know, a and game they, back. Yep. And, and the Cubs and Pirates aren't out by any stretch of the imagination. So. No, it's going to take a lot, though. It will. It's going to take a lot. I think, I think the Pirates are going to be interesting to see if they do any moves at the deadline. Like you said, we'll, we'll get more into this next week. We might just end up doing just a baseball episode because we'll talk about that for two straight hours. Uh-huh. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think the Pirates and Cubs are going to be the two teams I'm watching the most to see if they do anything at the deadline. Um, I would think the Pirates, think they may go and just try to get maybe a prospect or something to fill in a, a hole or two. I wouldn't expect them to go get a huge veteran to turn things around because they're Let's be honest. They're eight games under five hundred. They're eight and a half out of division lead. So they're, they're it's, competing. It's, they're competing, but it's 
it's not a loss if you're not in the playoffs this year by any stretch. It's a holy cow. We're almost a 500 baseball team. Finally. We haven't we haven't seen this in 10 years. Exactly. So we haven't seen this since Kutch was last year. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I think that alone, it's already been a victory this season for Pittsburgh. I think it's just a matter of plugging in the last few holes. And I think it's kind of the same thing with the Cubs as well. And the key for them is to not backslide because yeah. – Cardinals are right there, only four and a half back of the Cubs, three of the Pirates. The, remember, the yeah. Cardinals last year kind of did that same thing. Slow, very, very slow first half. Then they turned it on in the second half, so you can't sleep on St. Louis. And I think not. that helped with the, the Pujols run to, right. to home run greatness. Right. <laughs> and then lastly, the NL West, before we briefly touch on the All-Star game, because I completely forgot about it. <laughs> um, Dodgers and Diamondbacks, yeah. now they're tied at the top. Here comes the BS that the Dodgers are going to be able to run away with the division. I it, it's. I don't know. This is a fair I don't know. I'm going to be honest. I don't know about that. Because look at it. I really feel like the Diamondbacks actually have a legitimate shot for once to win it's, the title. It's a very well put together team. And hey, as long as Corbin Carroll does his job, I think they'll be fine. And so And he's done it so far. That's why he was interviewed while on the field. At the All Star Game, right? And then, how about San Francisco? Uh huh. They, 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 they're only two and a half back. It's going to be what I think will be a very exciting three horse race to see who comes out with the West. I would not be surprised if two of the three wild card spots are out of the West. It, it wouldn't shock me. I because, wouldn't be surprised. Well, well because you got to think about it. You look at the Central and how you know, kind of, you know. I wouldn't say top heavy; it's more bottom heavy, mm-hmm. and w- with how it'll you, depend on if the Brewers backslide or not. Right. So, it, it, two of the three could end up in the West, and the other one probably going to one of the teams in the East, being Miami. Yeah. At the team right. That's now. what I'm thinking. Is Miami's definitely in the wall card? I don't think that's changing. Well, they have a better record than the entire NL Central. Right. So, <laughs> and then the disappointment that is the San Diego Padres, but that city knows nothing but disappointment. So it's they're they're eight and a half back. They went six and four going into the mm-hmm. break. So it's it, it, they're they're kind of there, but like I that team's lacking a sense of identity right now because I don't know what to make of San Diego. It's interesting because, and I don't know how legitimate these are. I've kind of heard murmurs every now and then. I'm sure you have as well about Juan Soto may or may not. be be a trade piece for the Padres to kind of retool a little bit for their 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 back end. I don't know how legitimate that is, honestly, because you gave up so much for him. I don't see why you would then trade him two years after the fact. Yeah, he's not doing as well, but yet he was still an all-star. But I don't really see those happening. I think it's just a matter of they need to kind of figure out, like you said, they need to figure out their identity. They need to figure out what kind of a team they are and they need to then figure out okay what do we need to figure this out I don't see them as a playoff team this year I think it's just between Dodgers Diamondbacks and Giants and I honestly think all three of those will be in the playoffs this year but may or may not be in that order we'll kind of see how that pans out but yeah I really I don't think the Padres are going to make it I feel like they'll be a few games out of of that Six wild card spot, probably five games or so. Season's end, uh, they'll give a, a, a valiant effort and come up short yet again. Yeah. But yeah, I just I don't think it's going to happen this year. I think they really need to make a splash at the winter meetings if they want to actually compete in twenty twenty four for sure. So that's our look ahead at the second half. The predictions there. We'll talk more about the, our predictions in terms of. Uh, you know how it's going to look for the postseason down the line. Now, briefly looking here at the home run derby from two nights ago, and then the All Star game from last night. Home run yep. derby, Vladdy did it. Yep, and a, a very unlikely final. I mean, we you <laughs> predicted that Vlad would make it there. Hey, and I said okay. I, so I I I told our friend Tyler this. I said Alonzo. When I told him that, I guess I remembered wrong, but yeah, I'd, I'd have to go la- back la- and look at the podcast. Last but. week, you said Did I say that Vlad-y? Vlad was going to okay. end up in the final. I said that a Rosarena was a sleeper. Yeah, you did, and it, and obviously you and were right. He, he <laughs> gave him, he gave, he gave Vlad a run for his money. He did. He just ran out of steam down the stretch. Vlad wins with twenty-five home runs in the final. His longest one was four hundred and forty-five feet. 
Uh, hardest one was 112. Granted, th these are coming in like softballs. So, and the thing is, too, it's not only that, but it's Seattle, where the ball carries the left quite easily, and mm -hmm. you kind of saw that with a lot of second deck home runs going 405, 415. Uh, unless you started getting to left center, where you started to see them get close to the 440 for the bonus, but. Yeah, the ball carry is a lot easier to left than it does anywhere else in that ballpark. But it also doesn't carry as much as you would think. Now, yeah. I say that, I talked about last week about how that ball really does carry because of how the Astros do it. Whenever they go to Seattle more times than not, how they mash home runs out of it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I mean, mean you, we saw it with, with a couple players, especially the guy that you... Did not like in this derby at all and did not want to see in the derby at all in Adley Rushman. He, he, gave, he gave Robert hit from a both run. sides of the plate. Yeah. I don't know if y'all remember from the bonus round he had, but holy cow. It looked like he was just softballing a swing, using a Funko bat, and just easily just turning the wrist and just seven straight in that 30 seconds was he, insane. He nearly upset the one seed in Robert. Yeah. Nearly did. 28 home runs for Robert, 27 for Rutschman. So he he was impressive. That's what I said. I was like, I I, I think he's going to do a lot more than people are expecting. It. Yeah, right. He did a lot more than people expected. Now, the stunner in the first round mm -hmm. was Julio Rodriguez launching 41. That was impressive. Yeah, and I, I think he had the help of the juice of being in front of his home crowd, but he absolutely smoked Big Meat Pete. With you you got to retire that. I, I, I like it. <laughs> it's you a got to retire it. it, it. So, a, as I mentioned last week, I figured Julio was going to do well because, like you said, his home, he's in his hometown, basically, of that's where he plays. It's a stadium he knows. That's his home stadium, so he's more familiar with it. So he knows how to get the baseball out. I was not expecting a 41 in the first round. No. I wasn't expecting a 41, period, because... We were all talking about it when the home run derby was happening two nights ago because we were all on, on online on PlayStation chat, kind of just chatting and watching the home run derby. We were amazed at Adley getting twenty seven, much less Julio getting. And then Julio floor. goes forty one. That was insane. Now, as I figured, I didn't think he was going to make it to the final. I predicted it was going to be Alonso versus Vlad in the semi. So I didn't think he was going to make it out of the first, but Alonzo just disappointed in the first round. And he, in fact, looking at it, he had the third lowest first round home runs behind Mookie, who I figured was going to be the worst out of all of them. 11 home and, runs. And like, uh, what were you even doing And there? Adolis Garcia at, at 17. Excuse me. I know why he was there, because we have to have a token Dodger player in every single thing. So... I don't know if... If you haven't realized yet, folks, I hate the Dodgers. <laughs> I don't know if you watched the Derby or not. Um, I did not. At least when uh, Mookie was up. But not, not when he was up. I turned it on for the final. Yeah. But uh, they talked about how uh, Mookie actually wasn't going to be in the Derby because he's not that much of a power hitter. He's not. But his wife was the one that convinced him to compete in it and say, yeah, why not? Just do it. So that's why he took the invitation. Well, that's why you always listen to your wives, folks. <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic. I mean, you you got to respect them at the end of the day, but yeah. maybe this was the kind of thing. Plus, where it's a bucket list. Thing, it, it is. You, know? you, you can say to your kids, like, yeah, I played in home run derby yeah. once. Here, here, here's how I did. I did Three awful. minutes is up. Yep. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, and, and then getting to the final. I mean, first, before you get to that, talking about a Rosarena, like you said, the sleeper, he was 25. 24 in the first, 35 in the semifinal. Uh, against Luis Robert, who uh, a couple of people had predicted would win the whole thing. Um, and a couple of people have been kind of predicting, and even Dusty Baker mentioning Luis Robert in some interviews during the All-Star break, he might be somebody to watch on the Astros' radar. Mm. But obviously the focus, as Dana Brown has mentioned, the number one focus is starting pitching, as it should yes. be at the deadline. Yes. So that'll be something to watch so. again. We'll get into that next week. But... The final was awesome. Oh, yeah. The final was awesome between Rosarena and, and Vlad Guerrero. And Vlad comes out on top, 25 yeah. to 23. He joins his Hall of Fame dad, mm. the only father-son duo to win that title. And who knows if we're ever going to see that again. Because And just remember, folks, they're not Cuban. Yes. 
They're from the DR. Yeah. Dominican Republic. You got it. <laughs> because, you know, Craig Biggio never participated in a home run derby, so Kevin's yeah. not going to get there. Um, you're yeah. just, you're just gonna, we're just going to have to wait until you and I are and in our First L- off, Kevin needs to learn how to hit above the Mendoza line. Right. So I think the next time we'll see a father-son duo is one of the current players right now, and if they're sons, if they have any I would think it would be day. Bichette. Maybe. Did Dante ever win a home run derby? No, I think he competed, though. He competed in one. I don't think he ever won. I don't think Dante Bichette ever won one. So no. I'll, I'll, we'll look that up later. But yeah. then, And then lastly, brief touch on the All-Star game. You know, for years, folks, you know, being an Astro fan growing up, I always cheered for the National League in the All-Star game, especially when it mattered, when it, when the it mattered because it decided the home field advantage for the World Series. Right, which in hindsight was really dumb. But looking at it now, obviously I was cheering for the American League last night. I didn't watch a lot of the All-Star game. I turned it on and had it on as background noise. I was kind of the same, but I was I was still paying attention, especially when they did the player interviews, I would mm-hmm. pay attention. Right. And then, so you see, as you all know, National League comes out on top, and... Rockies catcher El- Elias Diaz gets the go-ahead home run. Yeah. That was stunning. National League's first uh, all-star win in since 11 years. 2012. Since 2012. Yeah. And I mentioned this in my sports report this morning on KSAM and the Lake. Um, ironically, the last time that the National League had won was in 2012, which prior to D- Domingo Herman's perfect game was the last time a perfect game was thrown in baseball in 2012 when Philip Humber for the White Sox, <laughs> Matt Cain for the D- Giants, and Felix Hernandez for Seattle <sighs> threw perfect games that year. Philip Humber is a throwback. Remember, he played for the Astros, too. I know, that year after he got the huge contract because of yep. the perfect game. And it didn't work out. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Congratulations to the National League, even though the All-Star game doesn't mean jack squat anymore other than just, you know, fun. That's that's what it is. And that's what In it other should words, be. Get, besides just getting a, a microphone on Adley Rutschman when, when he gets hit on the inner thigh. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> and then I thought Nathan Avaldi's mic'd up thing was kind of interesting, too. So Yeah, that and then Freeman and Betts both being on with their broadcaster, Joe Davis, who's uh. the Fox guy as well. Basically, Joe kind of leading him into, are we going to tamper here and get Shohei on the team? And Freeman immediately goes, that's tampering. I'm just going to say all 30 teams want him on the team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Attaboy, Freddie. <laughs> Smart guy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> He's been around this game. All right. We talked enough baseball long enough. We're going to step aside and take a break. We're uh, coming up after the break. We're going to actually shift into a more serious topic. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy right now going on in the world of college football, especially at Northwestern University. We're going to touch on that when we come back here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. I'm Carlos Zimmerman, Jordan Smith, alongside me here. Uh, just wrapped up our talk about the MLB and the draft and everything. And now we're going to transition to a little bit more of a serious topic because, you know, obviously we like to have fun here on the podcast, getting to talk about fun things. But, you know, as we know the, how the world of sports goes, there, there's a lot of things that could become controversial. And there's a lot of it going on right now in the news right now, especially in the college football realm. And, it's, you know, it's stuff we don't often want to talk about, but it's stuff that we feel like sometimes, you know, we kind of have to talk about it because that's just the reality of life. So, Obviously, there's a lot of uh, controversy surrounding University of Northwestern right now and a hazing scandal that they're in currently embroiled in. And uh, most of this is going to be ripping uh, an article here from Adam Rittenberg, a senior writer at ESPN, and he's providing his information on it because I just want to be able to cover all the bases, talk nothing but the facts before giving any of our thoughts on it. So Pat Fitzgerald, face of Northwestern football, um, one of the most – Decorated players in the modern era for Northwestern. And he goes on to become the head coach of the team and brings a lot of great stuff to the team. However, on Monday, University President Michael Schill fired Fitzgerald in the wake of an investigation into hazing allegations. This dismissal of Northwestern's most recognizable football alum, it obviously has rocked that program to its core. 
and a lot of questions are still unaddressed right now. And a Northwestern source told ESPN yesterday that you changed the trajectory of this place for 30 years, and that source said, I don't see how we get out of this anytime soon. It's quite catastrophic. So how did they get to this point? Well, back in November, a Northwestern football player emailed the school's senior associate athletic director for compliance with the subject line, Northwestern Football Hazing. And obviously that's in all caps, and that's going to catch the attention of any compliance director. Ask any compliance director in this country. That'll, ca that'll get your attention. The player has since left the school, and he outlined the practice of running where a group of older players restrained a younger player, often a freshman who had made an on-field mistake, and they engaged in some not-so-great behavior. Uh, Northwestern responded by launching an investigation, hiring an attorney to oversee this process. ESPN first reported about the investigation in January, interviewing former current former and current players, coaches, and staff. On Friday, Northwestern announced the investigation had found evidence largely supporting this whistleblower's claims, but had not found any evidence that Fitzgerald or other coaches knew about the hazing activities. However, investigators concluded coaches, quote, had opportunities to discover and report the hazing conduct. The school only released an executive summary of the findings, which included few details and no names other than Pat Fitzgerald's. Uh, the coach received a two-week unpaid suspension as part of several actions from the school, which included a football locker room monitor who wouldn't report to Fitzgerald or the staff. Well, the story shifted on Saturday when the whistleblower detailed the hazing allegations to the Daily Northwestern, which is the student newspaper at the university. Other former players corroborated all or part of the claims by the whistleblower. Current players released a statement signed by the team strongly supporting Fitzgerald. The current players said the allegations were, quote, exaggerated and twisted and that Fitzgerald was, quote, not involved in any of the alleged incidents in any way, shape or form. But the aforementioned Schill late Saturday night released a letter stating that he needed to reconsider Fitzgerald's penalty. Schill wrote that he did initially focus too much on what the report had concluded uh, and didn't know and not enough of on what he should have known. So after a little bit of silence period and more media reports, Schill called Fitzgerald on Monday and fired him. Fitzgerald held a brief staff meeting, addressed players in an emotional team meeting on campus. Obviously, several players were outraged at this, that neither Schill nor uh, Greg, one of their other members, were present for the meeting. And Schill would announce the firing in another letter writing that upon reflection, quote, Northwestern's football culture had, culture had been broken in some ways and that Fitzgerald is, quote, un ultimately responsible for the culture of this team. Fitzgerald would release a statement Monday night that he and the school had mutually agreed on his initial suspension and was surprised when Schill unilaterally revoked our agreement without any prior notification and subsequently terminated my appointment, end quote, thus ending the 17-year tenure for Pat's Fitzgerald. So, obviously, you know, it, the whole hazing thing, we've seen a lot of it more in the news lately. We've seen it in the past, before, and my really big stance on this is like, it, it's really cut and dry. Why even do it? I understand, you know, you know, I played football in high school, and you know, there you, there's locker room antics. You know, you're gonna you're gonna mess around and just have fun with your with your guys, but taking it to a certain point to where you're gonna hurt somebody, not possibly only physically, but emotionally, mentally, in some cases spiritually, and and amongst other things. To me, that's just taking it too far. And you're risking not only the career of yourself when you participate in these aspects. Not, I'm not saying the victim here. I'm talking about the people committing the hazing. You're, you're risking the careers of other people. Thus, in this case, like that of Coach Pat Fitzgerald. So my, my whole stance on this is like, why are we even going to do this to begin with? And you avoid this altogether. We, we saw this at New Mexico State. Now we're seeing this at Northwestern. It, it's, to me, it's, it's a shame that this stuff has to happen because, for me, I liked Pat Fitzgerald as a coach. He, he, was, he really turned that program around and has made it really a formidable foe in the Big Ten. And now they have to figure out where to go from here and try to find their way out of this controversy. And like I said, it's a shame that it happened to begin with. And, and like I said, I'm not taking a stance one way or the other. I'm just saying, like, what's the point of going through the process of trying to haze a player for your own personal amusement because that's what it is at the end of the day. It's just a shame that this has happened the way it has. Yeah, it is. And like you said, it's something that obviously we don't like to talk about, but we have to talk about it because it's happened. It's a big story, and it's something that needs to be talked about more. I was just kind of doing a little bit of research on the side, and 
a lot of st- most every state in the U.S. except for six have some form of a anti hazing law, uh, whether it's partially anti anti hazing or complete anti hazing altogether. Uh, the six that don't have any law whatsoever are Alaska, Hawaii, Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, and New Mexico. So there is an Illinois law, and I looked at the Illinois General Assembly to get this official law, and it is Section 12C50, and it says, A person commits hazing when he or she, is knowing requi- or he or she knowingly requires the performance of any act by a student or other person in a school, college, university, or other educational institution of this state, which Northwestern State, it's a public university, mm-hmm. so that gets tied into it. If it was a private, it would be a completely different story because they're not obviously getting state assistance. Um, but going on and saying hold part on, of hold it. On, hold on, hold yeah. on. It's a private research university. Is it a private research? Yes. Okay, so it, it, it kind of it, it, you know, it, it kind of changes things. So the, the law obviously still applies, but there's no state funding to the private university, so it, it, it kind of blurs the line there a little bit. But it continues on to say the act is not sanctioned or authorized by that educational institution, and that act results in bodily harm to any person. Uh, it's considered a Class A dis- uh, misdemeanor, uh, except that hazing results in death or great bodily harm turns into a Class 4 felony. Um, so, again, like you said, it's just something that shouldn't even happen in the first place. Um, I don't understand why it still happens nowadays. I get the aspect of, you know, we're the older guys, you're the new guy, whatever. You can do it a completely different way. You don't have to haze. You don't have to do everything that was, you know, explained and and everything that occurred according to this report. Um, Yeah, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand how, how this continues to happen, especially with what we've seen over the last five or so years of a lot of schools, teams, everything going away from that kind of hazing that had happened in the past. We've seen a complete change in that kind of culture um, with a lot of people, a lot of teams not doing that kind of stuff anymore, at least from what I've seen. I'm not a part of the programs or anything, so I don't see it firsthand. Right. But just from the outside looking in, it seems like a lot of colleges and a lot of teams have kind of turned – that narrative. So like you said, I was kind of surprised, especially with it being from Pat Fitzgerald from Northwestern, a school and a coach uh, and a staff that have done pretty well to, you know, like you said, return the program to where it was before or what it was once and, and return it to relevancy, especially in a very competitive big 10 conference uh, and something else too, that I know this doesn't really relate and kind of does. Cause it talks about Fitzgerald is that apparently he was a big, fundraiser uh, and kind of lead man for the $800, $100 million rebuild for Ryan Field, their football stadium. Mm-hmm. There's a huge plans and everything that happened, but because of all this, because of obviously his, his obvious firing with everything coming out, there's a whole question of if this, if the, any of the renovations of the stadium is even going to get built altogether. Right. So that's a whole other thing, but again, that's kind of off topic beside the point. But the point being, I don't understand why this still happens. It shouldn't happen nowadays, um, and I honestly think, especially for those six states that don't have a law, I think there needs to be just a a law that every state applies of no hazing at high school, college, public or private, or any ins- educational institution in general, no hazing, period, and apply the misdemeanor and then the class four if it gets further, but... There needs to be a punishment countrywide. And most, you know, what would that be? 44 of the 50 states have done this. So I applaud them, including the state of Illinois, where Northwestern is located. But, yeah, I just, I don't understand how this is still a thing. I don't either, but that's just the nature of our world today. You know, evil's still going to go about as long as this world exists. But obviously there are ways to be able to limit that. And, you know, you made a good point, Jordan. It, we've we've done a really good job across the board being able to limit that at that. I mean, in the early 2000s, you heard a lot about hazing and stuff like that. But once the 2010s rolled around, you didn't hear about it as much in the national media. But over the last year or last couple of years or so, it started to re- and rear its ugly head once again. So 
it's unfortunate what's happened, and you know, obviously, everyone involved at Northwestern wish you nothing but the best going forward because I know this is going to be a very hard thing to recover from. But ultimately, before we wrap up the segment, this reminds me of how blessed you know you in our case here, you and I, to be a part of the Sam Houston program because the culture here at Sam Houston is just immaculate. I got to see it firsthand, especially with basketball, with such a smaller team and, you know, getting to hang out with those guys. None of that stuff happens. Right. And and it starts from the top down. So I commend the coaching staff across the board here at Sam Houston for, for you know, building a really good culture around here and not allow stuff like this to happen. Because ultimately, like I said earlier, this changes trajectory of not only athletic programs or the university itself. It changes the trajectory of people's lives. And so – We'll see what comes out of it. Obviously, there's a lot more investigating to be done at Northwestern uh, before anything else goes further. So we'll see what happens. And like I said, we wish nothing but the best going forward despite the unfortunate circumstances. We'll step aside and take a break. We'll talk FIFA Women's World Cup as that's going to be ramping up here in a little bit, plus our final note before we wrap up the pod today here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. Hello, welcome back to the KCN Sports Podcast. I'm Jordan Smith. Alongside me is Carlos Zimmerman. And now we get to the world of the FIFA Women's World Cup. Uh, the USA trying to go for a three-peat in women's action. The best team in the world, obviously, right now with USA Women's Soccer. Uh, a good roster coming up here once again as, as per usual, basically. It's starting on the 20th. With New Zealand versus Norway, a 2 a.m. local time uh, match. I don't think I'll be awake for that one. Nope. <laughs> uh, but, you know, taking a look at some of the other matches. The first one for America uh, is in their group, obviously, as all these are Group E. Going up against Vietnam Friday, July 21st uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, to kick off their run. And then, of course, for Carlos... The first match for the Philippines. You're going to have to stay awake for that one, my man. Philippines versus Switzerland at midnight on Friday, July 21st. Oh, so. I'll be watching. <laughs> well, actually, is, so is it is it midnight? It's on midnight our time. Our time on yes. Friday going into Saturday or Thursday going Friday, into Friday? Friday, July 21st at 12 a.m. So that's going from Thursday to Friday. Yes. I'll still be in Louisiana. Pop it on your phone. It's on Fox Sports. Yeah, I probably will. <laughs> I don't have my YouTube TV up right now, though. So? What, uh, I could find a bootleg. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that on air. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, taking a look at, at this World Cup. First, we kind of have to mention it because it's a big it's a big storyline. Probably the storyline for the Women's World Cup besides getting a three-peat. Megan Rapino, the star, one of the main captains, the veteran of the team announced that she is retiring from at least international play um, for America uh, at the end of this World Cup. Uh, she said that in a story, she wanted to do it before the World Cup, so there wasn't the questions and the rumors throughout the whole World Cup of whether or not she was going to retire to distract the team. She did it so that way they could focus on just winning it all and getting the three-peat and Rapino going out on top. Yep. Um, but 38-year-old, the Ford, looking at uh, her stats uh, coming into this World Cup, she will make her 200th appearance in that first match in the World Cup against Vietnam. 63 goals and 199 appearances, 73 assists, and two uh, World Cup championships, those being the last two that she has had. Mm -hmm. She's been a part of half of them. Um, her first uh, goal was in 2006 against Chinese Taipei. Uh, first match she was ever in was in 2006 on July 23rd against the Republic of Ireland. Um, so she's been around a while. She's been at the helm a while for this squad. Um, and, of course, it's really going to come down to how much she's going to be able to contribute. But I say that you got a lot of great talent on this squad. Alex Morgan, Lindsey Huron are going to be the team captains, the co-captains for the women's squad at the World Cup. Just kind of taking a look 
at the rest of this roster. I mean, you've got some old names like Kelly O'Hare. Uh, Julie Ertz as well is in there as well from the, the last World Cup. I mean, you got a lot of really, really good players. Alex Morgan, Megan Rapino, um, just a lot of talent on this side. And I'm looking forward to seeing how they do it. I feel like looking at the groups, um, kind of breaking them down, starting with America in Group E before we get to the rest of them, USA, Vietnam, the Netherlands, and, uh, and Portugal as well. Say it one um, more time. Netherlands. Netherlands. Whatever. It says NED, so. It, it, it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's, the, it's the Netherlands, Jordan. Point being, America's getting through the group stage and winning it. That doesn't matter. No doubt in my mind. I don't care if they're Netherlands, Netherlands, or whatever. Holland? No, that, that's a different group. Deutschland. Are they even in the? No, Holland's not even in. Holland's it. another name for the Netherlands, you Nimrod. <laughs> Goodness I don't gracious! Care. I don't Social care. media bit for you right there. Yeah, basically. Point is, America's going to get through these. Oh yeah, they, sure. there shouldn't be an issue with that. Let's start going through the rest. New Zealand, one of the host countries, yep. so they get the auto bid. Mm-hmm. Norway, Philippines, and Switzerland, all getting in Group A. Like you said, not it, not a favorable group. For, for your team in the Philippines. No, and, and, and folks, I, I do want to preface this once more. I've done this across several different platforms. I'm not Hispanic. <laughs> <laughs> My mom is from the Philippines, so and I'm not from the Philippines, <sighs> but I will cheer for my mom's homeland, obviously. <laughs> and yeah, not a great draw <laughs> by any stretch of the right. imagination, but it's, it, it's a good time for them to be making their debut. They're amongst a lot of other... You know, countries that are making their debut in this Women's World Cup, which we'll get to in a little bit. So it's a tough draw. Obviously, you would think New Zealand would have a little bit of edge being getting to play in front of the homeland as well. Uh, Norway, obviously, lots of great talents have come from there. And Switzerland's always scrappy because, you know, despite it always being taking itself as a neutral country, um, it's definitely going to be very competitive. And uh, that'll be a good first test for the Philippines. But uh, well, looking through this other one, uh, Australia's hosting Group B, being a host and being in Group B. Mm-hmm. Quite an interesting draw. They get the Republic of Ireland, Nigeria, and oh, Canada. Yeah, it, it, like you said, it's an interesting group. Canada, the number seven team in the world rankings for, for women's soccer. Um, and you kind of take a look at the rest of it, obviously. Like you said, Australia just right behind them, a few spots at number 10. So it's a very top-heavy group with just those two alone. Right. Then you put in Ireland and Nigeria. You kind of have to scroll down a little bit. Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, sitting at 22. Uh, and, and Nigeria, you continue to scroll here. Number 40 in the 40. world. So they're kind of one of those teams that were not expected to make it, but kind of on the cusp of being right there. So being in this World Cup alone it's, should boost them. They are the highly, they are the highly, ra- the highest ranked team out of the CAF. Right. So, so and and that's the thing. So it, Nigeria, it'll be kind of interesting to see how they play underdog because that's that's what they're doing this whole World Cup, right? They've got a very, like we said, the t- two top ten teams in Australia and Canada. You got a top twenty five in Ireland. So. It's going to be interesting to see how Nigeria compete against them. It's going to be a lot like what we saw on the men's side with America in the 2010 World Cup Mm -hmm. when they had that group uh, and somehow sneaking their way into the knockout stage before being knocked out by Ghana. And then in 2014, group of death, making it through once again, all that stuff. But point being on the women's side, that is going to be a very competitive group in Group B. Now, mind you, Ireland's making – the Republic of Ireland, excuse yeah. me. It, they're making their debut. And an interesting fact here, 12 uh, countries m- from UEFA made it to the Women's World Cup. Mm-hmm. Ireland's the lowest of them at 22. That's how strong Europe is Yeah. in terms of soccer. And forgive me for being ignorant, folks. I don't watch a lot of soccer or football, <laughs> um, but – I know Europe brings out a lot of talent mm-hmm. across th- several different countries, so we'll see how it pans out with that group. Looking at Group C here, we've got Spain, Croatia, Zambia, and Japan. Not Croatia, Jordan. <laughs> Is it not? Costa Rica. Oh, my gosh. Look, it's the it's the three-letter acronyms, okay? They're throwing me off. It, it <laughs> it's CRC. <laughs> Like, Costa I Rica! I know there's not two There's teams, not a second C in Croatia! Look, look, look. Go USA. That's all I care about. I know. 
I know. But taking a look in comparison again to the world rankings, another top ten team, number six in the world in Spain. They're mm-hmm. always up there towards the top in any international sport. They're yep. they're just always that good. And then you got Costa Rica. Uh, <laughs> Kind of, you know, scroll down a little bit again to kind of see where they are. Number 36. So they're sitting right there, right at about where Nigeria is. Kind of the first ones outside looking in as far as the top 32 in the world. Mm-hmm. But they're, they're, they're finding their way in. Zambia uh, as well in that group, like I said. And then Japan. That one's going to be interesting. I feel like it's Spain's to lose, obviously. Um, but because remember, it's, it's that, only the winner of the group that... that, that um, that moves right. on, I believe. So, uh, well, no, 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 no. Is uh, it top two now? Top two yeah. go to the knockouts. That's right. So, it's. I feel like it's going to be Spain. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe, J- probably Japan, I well, would say. Japan, Number 11 J- in the J- world Japan's will probably make it. Japan's got a lot of. Uh, they, they, they've got a lot of history, obviously, yeah. in the Women's World Cup, having I won mean, it in the past. Even look at. You know, you got the World Cup matches. Uh, even look at. Uh, the Olympic, the Summer Olympics, when they would ha- obviously they would have the soccer tournaments, and it was USA against Japan in the the S- Gold Cup and back to back Olympics, silver medal or Olympic and then World Cup, simple silver medal in 2012 at yeah. the Olympics in London. They and that's them coming off of winning the mm-hmm. World Cup, beating the US in 2011, yeah, and then won and then was runner up in 2015. So yeah. historically. Very good. Very good. Very good national team. So, so I would think Spain and Japan are the ones getting that out of that. That will be, so. and when they match up, that will be fun to That'll watch. That'll be a very good matchup to watch. So, uh, Group D, England, Haiti, Denmark, and China. Mm-hmm. Uh, Haiti making their debut at the uh, Women's World Cup, 53rd in the, con- in the, uh, in the rankings. Mm-hmm. Uh, England, obviously, the uh, highest ranked. Excuse me, at number four. My goodness, Some, I ate something weird this morning. <laughs> actually, it was acid reducer. No, 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 no. It was it was actually what I, what I ate was really good. I'm not going to say it because they're not a sponsor. So, but it <laughs> if was, you like to sponsor, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how people are going to do that. Um, Denmark, number thirteen, mm-hmm. which is intriguing, and then China, which is fourteen. Very top heavy. Group. It's a very top heavy group. That's going to be a. It's going to be sad because you look at it. Poor Haiti. <laughs> I mean, yes, for that respect, but also one of these top 15 teams is not going to make it. No. That's the shocking part of all of that is because, remember, this isn't like, okay, we're all going to sit in a room and do this. They're all pulled out of a, a container. Just, yep, here's your group. As far as I remember, it's kind of like the same process as when they uh, do other stuff. But, yeah, they just pull it out, and they, there you go, done. Mm-hmm. So it's all at random. So the fact that there's going to be a top 15 team in this group that is guaranteed to not make it is insane to me. Yep. I think England probably make it, and I'd probably say Denmark, yep. honestly. I think China probably misses it by a point. Um, but, yeah, I think – and Haiti is just – they're just going to have to, you know, go through. Hope if for if the they best. can get a draw, they've won the World Cup for them. Yes. I'm going to be honest out of yep. this group because – it's a very tough group. And it's a country making its debut, so they did get a very tough draw. Yeah. So we'll see what happens there. Group E, United States, Vietnam, Netherlands, Portugal. We already talked about that. Clean. It, it's the United States to lose. United States are bust for Group E. Um, I would think the Netherlands or, or Portugal makes their makes a run at two. Now, oddly enough, Portugal so. is the other one out of the UEFA that's making their debut mm-hmm. in the, the Women's World Cup. So it'll be intriguing to see what they do. Yeah, they're number twenty one in the world making their debut. So they mm-hmm. they've they've shot their their program way up in in the rankings for sure. Um, and the Netherlands, they're number nine. So that's why I say they're they're right there as far as uh, being the other ones to really make a run for it. Vietnam sitting at 32, right at that cusp of in the world rankings. If the top 32 were the only ones to make it, they're they number 32. Yep. So it's it's going to be that, tough for Vietnam. That, that, but but that's still a pretty decent group. It, it it's is. It's not so much top heavy like Group D is, but, yeah. you know, it, it's... you got the number one team in the world. You've got another top 10, and then it just kind of it kind of goes towards the back half. But like you said, it's a decent group, and it's definitely one where you can see Portugal make an upset at some point in this group, whether it's a draw or pulling off a win against either the United States or against the Netherlands. I just knocked on wood because I don't want to jinx myself. Right. But point being, you could see a Portugal upset in this group. I, I would not be surprised with that. 
I would like to see Vietnam maybe upset the Netherlands. I don't know that that's going to happen. I just don't know that Vietnam is all the way there yet to be able to pull off a huge win against a number nine team in the world. Right. But, again, it's a sports soccer. You never know what happens you know, in the World Cup. It, it, you never know. It, 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 that's why I love these kind of world events like that. That's why when when, when it's during the Olymp- when the Olympics are going on, you're mm. not going to hear from me for about three weeks. Oh, I know. Every, every time when every I see the time, Facebook post. If it's winter <laughs> or summer, yeah. I am locked in. I have subscriptions to several different things, wasting <laughs> money left and right. Yeah. But I want to watch every bit that right. I can't even mean staying up till 3 a.m. <laughs> um, that, well, that, yeah, that's the case. Group F. Front! Oh, God, that... <laughs> Sorry, anybody with earbuds. I'll try to put an earbud warning maybe if I remember to edit that in. I, it was uh, the funniest <laughs> thing out of Miss... What was it, Miss Universe? I um, think so, yeah. Uh, what a group. France? Number five in the world. Jamaica making their debut. Mm-hmm. Or sorry, saying. not making their debut, but they're 43rd. Yeah. Uh, Brazil, number eight. Yep. And Panama, number 52. They're the one making their debut. Now, yeah, that one's shocking. <laughs> number 52 in the world making a yeah. – getting into the World but, Cup. But you look at it, you look at just the four countries in general in terms yeah. of their love for soccer, it's up there. Oh, yeah. And that's a really, for lack of a It's going to be the loudest crowd group. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that group is going to be the loudest groups when it comes to crowd noise. And, out of any and of them. all four have to really travel exuberant, exuberant uh, distances. Exorbitant. Ex- I don't know. Uh, um, a long way. A long way <laughs> to Australia and New Zealand, but they're going to travel. I'm just glad I'm not the only one that's messing up on this segment. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, for, okay, but you're messing up countries. <laughs> Shh, I'm, just messing like up, I'm just messing up big words that half the people watching probably don't even know what Just sound it out. Mean. You'll be okay. Thank you. <laughs> you, you too. Um, <laughs> probably France and Brazil. Right. The two that come out of this one. Right. Panama maybe will be intriguing, but it, it's, it's going to be tough for lack of a better too. term. Nah, I can't say that. Um, moving on to uh, Group G. I'll tell you after yeah, we're done. Okay. Uh, group G, S- Sweden. Sweden. South Africa. Italy. 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 And Argentina. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. It's it's a good group. It's a good even mix Sweden, of this group. number three team in the in the world. Mm-hmm. That's um, pretty much the outlier. Yeah. <laughs> South Africa is at 54. Yeah. <laughs> Italy is at 16. And Argentina is at, why well, I just lost them, 28. Wow, so that's, yeah, that's, that, that's a bottom heavy it, it's it's group. It's more even with Italy and Argentina. Obviously, uh, South Africa, like you said, is way down in the rankings. And the number three team is Sweden. They're... They're gonna win the group. That that's not out oh, of the that that's that's doubt. it. That's the only other guarantee besides the USA winning their group and probably Germany winning their group, which we'll get to here in just a second. Um, but you know, after that, with the rest of Group G, with South Africa, with Italy, and with Argentina, it's kind of I feel like it's gonna be a lot closer of a, a fight for second than a lot of people may think in this group. I don't think South Africa is going to make too much noise. I feel like they may pull off a draw against Argentina, potentially. But I don't know. I feel like it's going to be between Italy and Argentina for that two spot in, sure. in the group. And then looking at Group H, the final group of the World Cup, Germany, uh, as well as Colombia, uh, South Korea, mm-hmm. um, and then... So that way I don't mess this up. What's the name? I want to. I want to hear you oh guess. God. It. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me find the flag in the world ranking. <laughs> oh my god! I don't even think they're in the top fifty, dude. They're seventy-two. Holy cow! There making, we go. Making their debut. Seventy-two. Uh huh. No oh wait, that's the men's side. Hold on. Goodness gracious. My my thing is messing up because I tried to click on page two and it clicked on you. All right, to save time, it's Morocco. <laughs> it's Mor- okay. Yeah, see, there's no A in Morocco. Is it M-A-R? No, it's M-O. Yeah, it's M-O-R. M-O-R, but in the initials, it's (laughs) M-A-R. Yeah, M-O-R-O-C-C-O. You see what I mean? Countries are weird. Countries are weird. But anyways, yeah, Morocco's not making it. Countries aren't weird. Committees are weird. Yes. Okay. Morocco ain't making it. No. I'm sorry to say, but it's going to be a miracle and a half at the 73rd team in the world. The lowest ranked, 72nd, whatever. Point being, the lowest ranked team in the world as far as who's in the World Cup. Wrong. Zambia. Where are they? 77. 
Okay, either one of them aren't making it. Okay. That's the point. The, when you take a look at the rest of it, as I go back to the first page now <laughs> to find the top teams in the country, or in the world, I should say. Uh, I mean, looking at it, it, Korea's, it, Korea Republic at 17, uh, and then Colombia at 25. That'll be a good fight uh, between those two for second. But again, Germany's winning, winning the group. If they mm-hmm. don't win the group, there's a problem. If there's they somehow don't wrong. make it, then they need to completely rebuild. Because that would be an absolute catastrophe if Germany, the number, what, two team in the world. Not the first time that's country. Has they wouldn't do it. So anyways, <laughs> um, but looking at it, like I said, the USA, Sweden, Germany, those are the ones that are guaranteed to win the group, make it out of the group stage, and move on. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, it's going to be interesting. Do the host teams actually make it out of the group stage? I feel like they will. I feel like at least Australia will at number 10 in the world. Mm-hmm. They should make it out. When it comes to New Zealand, it's going to be a tough road to do it. The, in regards to who they have in their group, like we mentioned earlier, you know, Switzerland, Philippines, and Norway, uh-huh. um, it's going to be a little bit of a tough task. Switzerland at 20, um, and then, uh, of course, Norway at number 12. So they're kind of looking up at... Norway and Switzerland as the two probably expected to get at the, those, those top two. But it's not unrealistic for New Zealand to make it past the group stage and to get to the knockout stage uh, out of Group A. That was probably the best poll they could have gotten uh, when it comes to trying to make it. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, Australia and Canada, they should be the two out of Group B. Um, I don't think that's going to change. I think it's just going to be a matter of who's one and who's two. Mm-hmm. Um, the rest of them, it's it's gonna be interesting. It's up I, for grabs. I feel like Spain could easily win the group, but I feel like also Japan is gonna make a run for their money when it comes to being at the top and winning Group C. Um, other than that, everything else, it's gonna be kind of a wait and see because I feel like there could be some upsets in some of these other groups um, that could really change the dynamic of some of these knockout stages. Um. But, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of my look general at it. I feel like as far as getting through and going to the final, if USA doesn't make it, it's a disappointment. Yeah. Obviously, with being the back-to-back World Cup champions, trying to go for the 3 P, let Megan Rapino go out on a high note and basically finally bring in the new – or not bring in, but basically start the rest of the Alex Morgan is the top dog exclusively kind of stage. Right. Which started when Abby Wambach officially retired after the – uh, the gold medal victory against Japan uh, in the the World Cup, mm-hmm. um, but but yeah, I mean it's you know it's it's going to be a fun World Cup. I feel like the USA should absolutely be in the final again. If they're not, it's a disappointment. I'm picking them to win, not just because of 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 you know national pride, but just because I mean they're the best team in the world. It, it's it, going to take Germany or Sweden to knock them off. Right, they're the odds on favorites. And uh, so, obviously, I'm going USA as well, yeah. just uh, based on their pure talent alone. Yeah. Now, obviously, you know, before we wrap up this segment, I, I, I love the underdog stories kind of mm-hmm. things. We talked about all these teams that are, yeah, teams that are making their debut. Haiti, Morocco, yeah. Panama, Philippines, Portugal, Republic of Ireland, Vietnam, and Zambia all making their debuts. Yeah. Uh, this is the first time I- ever FIFA tournament that the country of the Philippines has ever taken part in. Yeah. Um, this is Panama, Portugal, and Vietnam's first ever FIFA women's competition, having only been making making it to the men's World Cup before. This is for Zambia. This is interesting. They're the first landlocked country in Africa to ever qualify for a men's or women's World Cup, which that's exciting for them. Morocco is the first ever Arab country to qualify for the women's World Cup. Um, there's some countries that didn't make it this year that qualified last year: Thailand, Cameroon. Chile and Scotland all qualified last year, did not make it. And the big one, Iceland. Mm -hmm. At the time of the rankings, at the time of uh, qualification, I should Mm -hmm. say, they were ranked the 16th team in the world, and they didn't make it. Yeah. Which is stunning to think about. Zambia was the lowest ranked team to ever qualify at 81st. So lots of stuff could happen, and that's why I said I love these kind of world events because you You never never know know what's going to happen. One thing I will say, kind of looking back at Group A, I 
I don't know if this is controversial or not. Probably is. I wouldn't put it past the Philippines to pick up four points in the group. I feel like they could get a win against New Zealand. And get a draw. And get a draw against Norway or Switzerland. Now, will it be enough to get them into the knockout stage? Probably not, because I'm assuming that Norway or Switzerland is going to win at least a couple, if not win the three in the group stage. And then from there, the second place is basically going to be on goal differential, as it mm-hmm. usually is with two and three. But I don't know. We'll kind of see how the Philippines do. But if they get four points with a win, probably against New Zealand is their best and only shot at getting a win in that group. And then getting a draw against either Norway or Switzerland, I think they could put themselves in a decent position to maybe get to the knockout stage in Group A. But again, it's going to depend on goal differential, and it's going to depend on if they actually pick up that win against New Zealand. Now, me being biased as I am, I don't think it's controversial at all because, you know, go mom's homeland. And that's why I brought it up. Right. And, you know, <laughs> you know it'd be a great thing for the country because yeah. this is a country that's coming off of getting its first ever gold medal in the Olympics back mm-hmm. in 2020 yeah. and making their first ever Women's World Cup. Will the men ever make it to that side? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just from talking with my cousins over there, you know, yeah. there, there's a lot of excitement in the country right now. Yeah. Because this is putting the Philippines back on the national stage. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to see what they'll do. Will I be up at midnight in Louisiana with, 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 with our youth um, probably <laughs> watching it? A thousand percent. <laughs> so I'm excited for it. And obviously we'll get to talk more about it coming up in the next episode. All right. Jordan. Yeah. What's it time for? It's time for our final note. Ah, yes. We need a jingle. We we do need a jingle. We need a jingle for that. Ah, hire someone else. Boom, boom, boom. Nope, that's NBC. <laughs> <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the final note is the finally the selection of the Hard Knocks candidate for the preseason for mm. the NFL. Of course, if you don't know. Basically, it's a preseason documentary where HBO goes out, films a team's pre uh, uh, training camp, preseason, so on and so forth, highlights a couple players they know will never make the roster, but gives everybody hope to make the roster, and then doesn't make the roster to just tear everybody down after building up hope because American sports. Uh, this year, it's the New York Jets. J E T S. <laughs> it was selected last night and officially broke the news by Adam Schefter. The New York Jets have been selected and have accepted the hard knocks thing. Apparently, a lot of teams have been starting over the years to say, no, get away from us. We don't want the spotlight. We don't want anything like that. But now I'm, I'm kind of not surprised the Jets ended up doing it. I think it's going to be kind of interesting to watch. It's I their mean, first. It's only their second one uh, over the last 13, 14, 15 years because the only other one they've been in is 2010. Uh, when they were featured then. Mark Sanchez years. Exactly. So it's going to be interesting because the main question, obviously, is going to be uh, what what's the dynamic going to look like between Aaron Rodgers and Zach Wilson? Right. We all know who's the starting quarterback. Zach Wilson. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's Aaron Rodgers. He's the starter for the Jets. I mean, come on. Yeah, it, it has to be. You don't, you don't sit there for months on end and wait for the Packers to give in to then get him. To the nuts are. So he's your starter. You got guys coming in. It's looking like a pretty decent roster. We saw it a little last year. They had some some moments to shine. Not not moments of perfection, but some moments to shine. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it, it's it's gonna be interesting to see how they have Rodgers in the fold now and how that offense changes, how it, you know, escalates, whatever. Um, how many fifty three time audibles at the line Aaron Rodgers calls or not. But <laughs> Point being, Hard Knocks is in East Rutherford Atta because boy. they're not because they're not Atta New boy. York. Boy. No, I was, I was trying to come up with a different joke. For a, you, no, you paused for a second and I yes. was like, "Don't say New York." Don't no, no, say no. New York. I was trying to come up with a different joke, but I couldn't come up with anything because New Jersey's not worth it. So, uh, what's your take on all this? <laughs> See, now you make a good point. Like, yeah, come on, folks. Aaron Rodgers. It, it, when you when you have a choice between a perennial Hall of Famer. And the mother lover that is Zach Wilson, <laughs> you you go with the Hall of Famer, right? So I'm intrigued. Now I don't have HBO, so I probably won't be watching this. So Same. I'll just catch the highlights on YouTube when they're released. Yep. 
I'll be intrigued to see how Aaron operates in East Rutherford because, you know, he's called Lambo home for his entire career, being the prodigal of Brett Favre. And that's probably not the right word. Prodigal but son. Prod- you didn't finish it. No, I mean, I wouldn't say prodigal son, just the successor. There to you Aaron go. Aaron Rodgers, to Aaron Rodgers, or to Brett Favre. Goodness gracious. <laughs> um, we need to get out of here. We do. <laughs> We've been cooped up in this room too long today. <laughs> um, and, or, but because you already did the Zach Wilson experiment, it wasn't the best. Right. So I'm intrigued to see how, you know, all of that operates on camera. And we'll see what comes of the Jets this year. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Football season's right around the corner. Training camp starting. We know it. What a few weeks from now? Training camp starting. Uh-huh. So preseason will get started in August with the three week preseason, and then we'll dive right into the regular season and go through the next eighteen weeks, and then the playoffs, and then we're done again until next whatever, because the XFL and USFL don't matter. Right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, now one one last thing before we touch. Yeah. I mean, I I, I am a fan of Hard Knocks. Mm-hmm. Especially when the Texans were featured on there. That was so great. It was so great. Vince Wilfork in overalls <laughs> was something in I didn't only think I needed. Overalls. Yeah, in only overalls <laughs> was something I didn't think I needed in my life, but I did. And then uh, I, I'll do, I'll just say one thing here, Jordan. I'm Susie Carmichael <laughs> from the Rice Owls. From the Rice Owls. <laughs> I'm so. He's keeping the face. No, he's keeping the face. No, because you said you mentioned at the top of the segment that you know there are players that you're not going to get fe- that are going to get featured that don't make the team, and Kari Lee was one of them for the Texans. God, I wanted him to be on the team. So I know. Bad. Because I just wanted more social media clips of him mocking Bill O'Brien. Funniest <laughs> thing <laughs> I've e- I had ever seen in terms of football. Oh, that was it was amazing. It was great. I, it was spot on too. Right I on think. the nose. <laughs> We're going to compete and work hard. How are we going to do that? By competing and working bleeping hard. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was it was perfect. And I can't think of a more hysterical hard knocks than that one, at least that I actually watched. Folks, go on YouTube and check it out. It's, it's, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> funny as ever. Funny it, as ever. It's awesome. It's awesome. So that, that does it for our show. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming up next, we are going to or next week. I should say, come out next, next. Just add week to it, I guess. Maybe. No, 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 not next week. <laughs> well, I guess not next week because you're out of town. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I got, <laughs> I got, I got, I got to go. <laughs> like, like I said, I'm going with the youth to yep. up from Northside to Louisiana Tech for our summer camp. So that's where I will be. You'll get next used week. to Rustin pretty quickly. No, it's really funny because <laughs> I'm going there. Yep. We're going to go there for football. We'll go there for basketball and the baseball tournaments in Ruston. Mm-hmm. So. Get used to Louisiana once again. get used to northwestern Louisiana. Find the guy with the job. Folks, we need your help with this, okay? This is something we experienced in 2021 at the Southland Conference Baseball Tournament. Okay, but we're not going to Southeastern. I don't care. We need to get this man. We're going to Louisiana. We need this guy's jambalaya. Finding the jambalaya guy. That's going to be the name of our biography. Fo- <laughs> <laughs> we need to just start. Uh, uh, we need to put this on Twitter or Facebook or something. And we need the Southland jambalaya guy. Hashtag Southland jambalaya guy. We need to find this guy because holy cow. We spent um, 30 bucks each and they were five bucks a bowl. Yeah. Maybe. No, no, I, think it was, <laughs> I thought it was 40 between. It, it may have been amongst you and me. We spent we spent money. We spent way too much on it, but I'm telling you right now, it was the best jambalaya I have ever eaten. And I grew up on Zatarains, mm-hmm. which is fake Louisiana, but <laughs> it's as close as I'm gonna get for right. being a Texan. It was very good. My God, and I'm I, I don't know when I if I'm since I'm leaving for Louisiana on Monday. I don't think <laughs> I'm gonna have jambalaya. Depends. <laughs> I'm at the mercy of Louisiana Tech's cafeteria. Look, as long as you tell them that on the way to Louisiana Tech, y'all stop at uh, 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 get some po' boys. This is look. This is a group of 69 youth group members. That's a lot of people. That is a lot of people split between five vans and. Um, and That's a lot there's of about there's about ten of us <laughs> yeah. leaders going, so I'm willing to bet we're going to stop at something like Chick Fil A, not a sponsor, um, <laughs> not a sponsor I, for this. Yes, <laughs> we appreciate Chick Fil A <laughs> when it comes to the uh, Hornet Nation <laughs> coaches show very much, but which we'll talk more about in future episodes. Yep. Um, but 
we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I will enjoy yeah. my little sabbatical over to Louisiana before I come back because that's the last break I get before <laughs> we go full steam ahead into football <sighs> and eventually into basketball. So yep. it'll be good. So we've said all of that to say there's no show next week. <laughs> <laughs> you see, folks, we ramble. We are now at an hour and 46 when we originally thought this is going to be an hour 20 show. In our recording, it's an hour 47 now, so probably about an hour and a half. Edited that down, <laughs> yeah. Probably somewhere around an hour and a half, maybe a little over, but either way. So not next week, but the week after. We'll have World Cup talk. That'll be in full swing. That'll be at least a weekend, probably nearing the middle to the end of the group stages, the like start of the knockouts. And then the other half of the show, we'd like to talk about NBA free agency, but... Let's be real. It's probably going to get cut. It's going to be a thousand percent a at least an hour of trade trade deadline talk just because we ramble about baseball. As you see, we, we, we love baseball. almost the entire first hour was baseball. We love baseball. So that's probably going to be what the show is two weeks from now. So enjoy, folks. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so that's our show um, for this week. I'm Jordan Smith. He's Carlos Herman. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you all in. Two weeks for our next episode of the KSAN Sports Podcast. So long, everybody. I need a nap. Bye. <laughs>